the story of a young American monk ordained in Thailand. Went to study with one of the famous forest Ajans and asked the Ajahn what meditation object is going to bring calm and peace to my mind. And the Ajahn said, I don't know. You have to find out. And the young monk hearing, I don't know, thought it meant that I don't know anything about meditation, and ended up disrobing, going someplace else. But that's not what the Ajahn meant. Each of us has to find out what's going to work for us as we meditate. You have to find the object that's most suitable for him and the best way to relate to it. Because the whole purpose of working with the mind and bringing it to peace is to, to get it to settle down. And the way to get it to settle down is to give it something where it likes to stay settled. And what's going to work for you is going to depend on your preferences, going to depend on your background, depend on all kinds of factors that are purely personal. So for each of us, the process of developing concentration is a personal thing, an individual thing. So you have to explore. And there's no telling exactly what kind of breathing is going to be good for you or whether there are times when you need to focus on something else instead, like contemplating the Buddha, recollecting the Dhamma, the Sangha, contemplation of the body, thoughts of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. It's really a personal matter which of these is going to work for you. So there's no one-size-fits-all one kind of meditation. Breath meditation comes the closest, because after all, we all have a breath, and for all of us it's an important part of our lives. And John Lee recommends taking it as your home base. But there are times when you need to forage around in other areas. You find yourself way off in left field and have to find your way back to home base. And it may require thoughts of goodwill to get back there. It may th require contemplation of the body. And again, this is something you have to learn to explore for yourself. You have to experiment. You have to learn how to observe to see what works. This is why being observant is so essential to the practice, because there's a lot that even the most psychic teacher who can read minds cannot tell you. And John Fung, whom I firmly believe could read my mind and the minds of many other people, said one time that even when you can read minds, you can't tell what's going to work for somebody how they will respond to your words, what technique is going to work for them. That's something that they have to find out from within. So be willing to explore. The same principle applies not only to getting the mind to calm down, but also to insight. There's a sutta called the Riddle Tree, in which a monk goes to different senior monks and asks them, you know, what topic do you contemplate in order to gain awakening. And one monk says the five aggregates, another one says the six sense media, another one says the six elements, another one says dependent core rising. And the monk was not satisfied with all these different answers. Couldn't believe that there would be many different answers. So he went to see the Buddha. And the Buddha said, well, the different answers were like the riddle tree. Apparently there's a tree, it's kind of like the coral tree, which at some parts of the year has leaves, and other parts of the year has no leaves at all, and it has red flowers during the period when it has no leaves. And apparently it's called the riddle tree because people would say, what's the riddle tree like? And it depends on which time of year you're talking about it. In the same way, the Buddha said, those different monks answered in different ways because for each of them a different topic worked. And so they talked in line with what had worked for them. So again, with regard to insight, there's no one-size-fits-all, there's no one technique that's going to work for everybody. But if you're observant while you calm down the mind, you'll begin to see the way your mind works. 
And that will often have a lot to do with what topic is going to work for you in terms of developing insight. Some people, as they're meditating, tend to focus on the whole issue of feeling, what feelings are pleasant, and how you relate to pleasant feelings. Sometimes you find it easy to stay focused on the breath and have a pleasant feeling sort of alongside the breath and not get distracted. Other people have a real problem. As soon as there's a pleasant feeling coming up, they run to the pleasant feeling, drop the breath. So in that case, it's going to be important to gain insight into the nature of feeling, just to get the mind to settle down. This is how discernment fosters concentration. The typical pattern, of course, is that concentration fosters discernment. But as the Buddha said at one point, to get the mind to settle down good, strong concentration, you need both tranquility and insight. Sometimes you'll depend on more than on one side than on the other. And it'll vary from day to day, from session to session, even from right now to five minutes from now. So you'll find there are times when you're trying to get the mind to settle down. It's simply a matter of getting it calm and not thinking about anything else and allowing the meditation object just to do its work. At other times, you have to understand what you're doing, understand the problems that are arising, learn how to ask questions and attempt answers. So if you notice that you're having a problem slipping off into feelings of pleasure and then just find yourself in a nice hazy spot where you don't really know where you are, you're not asleep, but you're not really focused on anything. Okay, you know you've got a problem with pleasure, so you've got to back up. What can you do? Well, when there's a pleasant rhythm going in the breath, you've immediately got to work on developing your frame of reference, your awareness, so it fills the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. In other words, you have to change your perception of what you're focused on in order to overcome the feeling. This, of course, then gets you into issues of perception, the word sanya in Pali, and the role that that plays in the meditation. And so in cases like that, you may find that the sanya, the perception, becomes the issue around which you have to focus in order to gain insight. This is particularly true as you're shifting from form levels of concentration to the formless. It's a shift in perception. You're right here. And you go from, say, focusing on the breath, and you get to the point where the breath gets really still. You begin to notice that the, the boundary of the body begins to disappear. And it's as if the, your sensation of the body is just this cloud of little sensation droplets or little sensation points. And you learn how to stay there for a while. Sometimes you feel afraid of the fact that the breath isn't coming in and out, so you switch back. And you have to learn how to not get carried away by that thought construct. Okay, there's thought construct as a problem. When you find you get past that, then there's the question of focusing instead of focusing on the little droplets or points of sensation, you focus on the space in between. Now, if you find yourself suddenly visualizing infinite space, it might get disorienting. As your mind stretches out to the limits of infinity of that space, that can be disturbing. So you've got to focus and set it on. Which sense door are you focused on? Are you focused on the visual sense door? Or are you focused on the, the bodily sense door? This is where you switch from issues of the aggregates to issues of the sense doors. Stay simply with the sensation of space. Don't go off into the visualization, because the sensation of space can be really pleasant. The visualization can be disorienting. And then from there on in, it's more an issue of perception again. How are you going to label this experience? You can label it as space. Or you can place you can label it simply as infinite consciousness, what's aware of the space. Or the sense of oneness in that infinite consciousness. What happens if you drop the perception of oneness? And so on down the line. 
Did you see that as you meditate, get the mind through stages of concentration, you're going to be shifting from issues of thought fabrication or perception or feeling, or consciousness, form, the body, all the aggregates. Or you may find that the issue is how you visualize things as opposed to how you feel them. Those are the sense media. We start looking into questions of causation. What are you doing that's causing stress in any particular state of mind? You can't let go of the stress. As the Buddha said, it's your duty with regard to stress is to comprehend it. But you can figure out what thought formation, what craving is causing it. And then you can stop that. It's like finding yourself choking over smoke. You can't put out the smoke, but you can put out the fire. And you find that this kind of analysis works on getting you from one stage of concentration into another. So simply putting the mind through its paces as you get it to concentrate begins to throw up certain issues about the aggregates, the sense media, causality. And the issue that you tend to find most fascinating, or the one that causes you the most trouble, those are the ones, those are the issues you're going to have to focus on for the sake of insight. The insight first that leads to stronger concentration. And the insights that will lead to release. So no one can tell you beforehand what's going to be the topic on which you can settle down, what kind of breathing is going to be best for you, or there, when there are times you have to focus on something else in addition to the breath, or, or beside the breath. And no one can tell you what's going to give rise to insight. And you have all sorts of insight techniques out there. But what they really are is just sophisticated forms of concentration. The actual insight has to come from seeing how your own mind works, and the best way to see it working is to put it through the laboratory of getting it to settle down. It's like learning how to cook. You can just throw some ingredients in the pot and hope that it comes out okay. Or you can be begin to notice what kind of cooking techniques work best so the thing doesn't burn. So if you're fixing a stew of different vegetables, which vegetables have to go in first, which vegetables go in later, so that you don't end up with some undercooked and others overcooked. Looking for the technique of what works, that's what gives rise to insight. It gives rise to understanding the food, and the same principle works in the mind. You've got to notice what works, where you have problems. Learn how to question the problems. Figure out an answer. The basic terms of analysis, in terms of the aggregates, the sense media, the elements, dependent core rising, are there to give you ideas. But as to what's actually going to work in any particular situation depends on your own proclivities, your own powers of observation, your own ingenuity. But that's when the insight becomes not just a topic you read about or something you try to impose on the mind. But something that grows naturally out of the practice of learning how to bring the mind to a sense of peace, a sense of calm. And the more natural the, the questions and the experience get, the deeper the insight is going to go, and the more relevant it is to the actual suffering that's going on in the mind. So this is why meditation is a process of exploration. You're not trying to clone enlightenment. You're trying to explore cause and effect as they reveal themselves in the process of bringing the mind to a sense of peace and calm.